Welcome to the Vision by Protivity interview. I'm Joe Kornick, Editor-in-Chief of Vision by Protivity, our global content resource examining big themes that will impact the C-suite and executive boardrooms worldwide. Today, we're exploring the future of money, and I'm happy to be joined by Nish Dharmaratne, Managing Director, Global Head of Product, Payments, Liquidity, and Digital Solutions for GTS Westpac. She also is a board member for the Australian Payments Network and an advisory board member for Women in Payments. I'm pleased to hand off interviewing duties today to my Protivity colleagues, Director Ruby Chen and Senior Director Rupesh Mato. Rupesh, I'll turn it over to you to begin. Nish, so good to meet you again. Uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you about you know, what's happening in the payments world. Uh, and thanks for doing this for us. Thank you, Rupesh. Thanks for the opportunity to join you and Ruby today. So Nish, uh, as you are at the center of uh, you know, the payments, there has been so much impactful changes in the payments landscape over the past few years in Australia. Uh, I can name a few like real-time payments using NPP, OSCO, and now Pay2. Uh, there has been a you know, strong advancements of mobile app payments. Uh, there have been a great development in open banking uh, and how to make payments frictionless you know, using the infrastructure we have developed over the years in Australia. Uh, my question to you is, what's next? What's what's going to change in the next, you know, three to five years? That's a really good question, and I'll break that into a couple of parts. Um, in terms of trends, clearly there are trendsetters and trend setting, and opportunities. That's plenty. Um, what is really interesting, Rupesh, is in general the payment volumes have been growing. As we all know, um, the the way in which the Australians are making payments have changed. But the most important point is the way in which consumers, particularly individuals, the way they have started adopting to into the new payment solutions. What is most interesting is also younger consumers between, say, age 18 to 29 um, are the highest adopters of mobile devices. So the demographic and the flavors are changing, which is also obviously helping to set the trend. Um, I think we are also picking up a number of global trends. Obviously, um, the wallets usage of mobile wallets um, has picked up. It's part of a very tech-savvy consumer who wants to make the payments, whether you make a payment here in the Australian market or overseas. Um, what is also interesting to see is the decline in cash. So um, there's been a 90% plus decline in the cash usage in the, again, last decade or so. Um, and very smaller population of institutions using cash for various very specific payments now. So if you think about um, the overall trend is people are becoming more and more savvy with payments, which wasn't the case in the past because average consumer would walk into a bank branch most likely and discuss their payment matters if they are making a payment overseas or if they are making a payment to buy a house there are very specific requirements to meet now things have become extremely merged into a very very digital experience so um, the Australian Banking Association they prepared a report um, around digital wallets one of the one of the points that came up in that is about 746 million was was the usage of digital wallet total usage um, in 2018, it's gone to staggering 93 billion by 2022. So uh, a lot of these were based on people are registering their cards into the digital wallet, which is now standing to be about 15.3 million registrations of mobile wallets. So that's clearly one, one trend, which is I feel that the consumer choice and consumers are making decisions. The second one um, is payments going real time, really, really, really fast. And um, we make um, about 650 billion worth of payments every day. And uh, most of you and Rupesh, you mentioned this, that the Australian real-time payment system, which is also called New Payment Platform, NPP, it has grown since its launch uh, back in the 18, 2018. Um, Today, uh, this payment process, process about uh, 1.3 billion transactions um, uh, and $1.5 trillion worth of transactions. It is still not at the 100% usage. If you compare with the $650 billion we make, it's still only a fraction of it has moved to NPP. 
But as you rightly called out, the new functionalities or overlay services that are getting built on top of real-time payments, things like pay to, which is equivalent of a request to pay service in other markets, is actually going to change the game really, really quickly next year. And we feel that um, there are there are not only a bank's play anymore, because usually we have four major banks and about 20 other tier two, tier three banks. And then there's about hundreds of credit unions and smaller agencies that provide banking services. But when you look at the NPP, there are 100 payment providers connected with NPP. They are varied between fintechs, new ventures, um, up and upcoming uh, companies that are providing different parts of the payment value chain. So the reach is higher because it reaches about 90 million customer accounts and the depth is um, getting uh, better because of the different types of solutions all these hundred providers are um, wanting to provide to the market. So I feel that the second trend, as I mentioned, is how fast can real time go? It's going to go really, really fast. I, I totally agree. The payments, uh, which was quite invisible uh, you know, in the ecosystem, has started becoming quite visible to our end user. My question to you is, you know, from you wearing a Westpac hat, uh, what, you know, how, how are you, you know, taking care of end user experience as a key differentiator in, in your world? There are literally two camps as far as the Australian market is concerned. There are the larger institutions, banks like ourselves, and then there are institutions that are, um, that have been investing through various um, investments into fintech financial technology. Now, there's a lot of collaboration going around, but at the same time, we are all used to batch-based payment systems. And what it means is we accept a file from a customer and we process two, two times a day and we are done by end of the day if possible, where the customer then gets the money in you know, day two or day three. Now, that really has changed in the last few years anyway because of the introduction of APIs, um, and host-to-host -host systems have already been in a mature stage anyway. But what is really interesting about the technology is if you look at the way in which the banks themselves put together, just the banks, invested um, $28.5 billion um, in, in from 2005 to 2022. And this is also ABA statistics I'm sharing with you. What that means is banks have invested eight times over for, to their technology. So that clearly says that if you are an institution which is not cloud native, not on cloud, has legacy infrastructure, you got to move and you have a plan to move to cloud. If you don't have, if you haven't started using uh, latest technologies like APIs and now AI, etc., you're going to be lagging behind. So all of that investments really going in to make the customer experience better because customer is looking at a lifestyle choice when it comes to payments they don't want to make a, a a different decision when it comes to a payment like a good example we all know ride hailing through an uber or through any other um, other service provider you do not want to be able to think about the payments you just want to get to from point a to point b get out from the taxi Someone else is going to take care of the payments. But what is really important for the consumer is what does that mean from a loyalty and rewards perspective? So consumer experience on one side, the more digital it is, the better off we will all be, but also how that's going to get connected to something that's going to monetize for the consumer. It's going to be really interesting because not everyone will be able and has the economics to be able to provide a reward or a loyalty every time you use a service, but consumers, and especially the demogra demographics I mentioned earlier, the 18 to 29 year olds that are entering the workforce and spending, will expect that um, user friendliness, will expect that um, reward, and will expect um, to be loyal to the brand if everything works fine. The other part of your question, Rupesh, was around, um, I want to share an experience um, and an example with the new feature we are building on new payment platform called Pay2. Uh, Pay2 for payers is already live. That's a request to pay service for those who are not familiar with the market. Um, that's going to be end-to-end -end digital. What it means is you literally walking into a merchant or let's say your gym, you request um, the gym wants you to pay $50 a month 
and there will be an electronically or digitally created mandate that gets accepted right across from the merchant's bank to the um, to your bank and then you will accept through the banking app or through the banking channels uh, that's going to happen within two to three seconds um, true it hasn't come into the market fully yet we are all launching that in the coming year and it'll reach some maturity because we are working with a number of institutions particularly the biller organizations to help them to understand this is going to be the new way of collecting your receivables this is going to be the new way of collecting uh, faster collection. So let's work together. And that's going to be a really, really interesting customer experience end to end digital. Hi, Nish. It's so great to be able to interview you. Um, you talked about you know, emerging trends, um, the so what, the user experience. And I was so mesmerized by the, you know, the, the new P2, which sounds so fascinating. And now we're moving on to risk and governance, a topic which um, is equally just as important, I think. So as we move into new and enhanced digital experiences around payments and the transfer of money, what type of risk, governance and regulatory standards do you think is necessary? Good question, Ruby. Um, I will take that the question in reverse order because I think it's important to set the context in terms of regulatory, govern, planned governance, and then I'll talk a little bit about the risks. So, Regulatory standards, the Australian systems or legislation has not been reviewed for the last 15, 20 years. The, the Check Act goes back to the 1980s, 90s. The Payment Systems Regulatory Act, which talks about payment systems regulation, goes back to 1998. Um, and there hasn't been any revision of these legislations for a very long time. Now, this really linked back to the, um, the announcement and the strategic payment modernization plan that the government and the Treasury is keen to um, uh, implement in Australia. And what we've actually done um, is we've already started consultancy on the Payment Services, Payment Systems Regulatory Act. Um, and there are a couple of discussions happening in terms of feedback of how to go about this change. Um, what does that mean? As you know, with this, with the plan, we are looking at uh, phasing out checks in 2030 and also looking at a way to reduce the batch-based system called um, BEX, which is batch-based um, uh, exchange system for low value transactions. Uh, we're thinking of uh, uh, looking at um, f organized way of phasing that out as well into the future, quite similar to the checks timelines as well. So, I feel 23 and 2023 and 2024 is going to be very, very exciting times for us with the changes that are proposed through these legislative reviews that are taking place now. And the second part of the governance and regulatory standards is we will expect also uh, some level of payment standards body to be set up, and that will then take care of uh, some of the work we are doing today on message enriching messages, the ISO 20 or 22 standards, and the things we need to do um, even around fraud, etc., is all going to be part of the standards that we expect through a standards body. And that's going to be a piece of work that the industry is going to work towards. Um, and then last part about the governance is licensing. Um, Australia has been a very free market um, led by demand and supply of consumer, consumer choice, consumer rights um, prevails over many things, but we've never had, a, uh, other than a standard banking licensing regime, we've never had a payment service provider licensing. So you do find a lot of the global brands and global providers who's, who's in this market doing extremely well, providing the services but not much of governance going around it. So the second part of that really is, Ruby, we expect that the governance is going to get better for obviously for the betterment of the consumer. Now let's talk about risks because I think the biggest risk at the center of all of the risk categories is fraud, fraud and scams. Um, this is really a huge, huge area that the, the banks, uh, all of the participants, including government, is really keen to... Um, look at some solutions or enhance the existing capabilities that we've built. So the Australians put together, um, lost about 3.1 billion uh, for scams last year. And mind you, that's just the reported number. So the common types of romance schemes, scams, lottery scams, money transfer scams, even grandparent scams, who would think, right? So 
consumer protection, therefore, is top of mind for the regulator, government, and ourselves as banks. So the government backed a uh, uh, federal budget uh, through the federal budget. They backed a package of $86.5 million to be able to combat scams and online fraud. On top of that, uh, major banks already established means of fraud checking, payment verifying, um, and we, we ourselves at Westpac, we have a payment verification service offered to the customer when they, when they set up um, payers in the online banking channel. So this risk area is a huge area for us. Um, there's also work that the industry bodies are looking to implement a common confirmation of payee solution um, that will get discussed um, in the coming months as well. So there's a lot of focus and attention. Everyone's doing their best, but um, frauds and scams continue to be a challenge for many Australians. The second risk, which I think is really important, is the cyber risk. And that is not uncommon to any market anywhere in the world. Cybersecurity and enhanced means of contingencies in the event of a cyber scenario is um, something that the uh, prudential regulator is very keen for all regulated entities to implement and make sure we have the contingency plans to support our customers. Another area that is of um, very big interest to me is just women in payments. So, you know, you serve on a few boards and you're the advisory board member for the Women in Payments organization in Australia. So which um, reflects your passion around this area. So what are your views towards the role women can play in driving the future of payments uh, industry or ecosystem? And why do you think it is so important to have more women involved in shaping the future of the industry? Yeah, I, I think this is the hardest question, right, um, of all of it. Um, the others are pretty easy given I'm in the midst of building and delivering solutions to the market. But this one I never thought as a, anything that is differentiates uh, a person as a, as a female leader driving through changes. But actually, it's a very good question, Ruby, because when I look back, and I've been in the banking for 30 years, and when I think about payments, Payments was never in the forefront of banks. Banks were busy lending. Banks were busy taking deposits. And I myself has been a balance sheet specialist for uh, early parts of my career. So I became a payment nerd much later or mid-career. Maybe it's a midlife crisis, but I moved over more towards payments on the last probably 10 years or 12 years of my career. But um, as I said, when you look back in the banking ages ago, Payments was really a payments could be a technology area who's just helping you with technical customer payment files or exchanges between banks or, you know, managing when there's a job failure on the technical side of things. Or the other career path around payments was just in operations. Basically, there were many uh, systems, but all the systems did not talk to each other. There's a lot of manual operations. Therefore, Lots of females tend to be more on the operation side as opposed to the technical side. So you could almost see that a large part of the technical payment technology side was dominated by males. And I'm making a very general comparison here, but operations jobs were females. But look around now and you could see that if at all, equal or more participation from women in payments related services. And that's really, really interesting because I think it's a bit like women in technology, but women in payment itself is something that has we have evolved over time. And I think women have been much more learned, much more educated, much more willing to take risks in, in their career, chosen career path. That's just, you know, helped to be where we are today. And the other thing that is really important is the number of uh, new ventures or financial technology company or startups that women do play a key role. Now, I'm gender neutral around these things because all types of diversity is really, really important. Diversity brings the best of, you know, diversity of thought in particular brings the best when people collaborate and it's essential during an area like payments, which needs a lot of ideation and innovation and people need to be working together. So all perspectives are extremely important. But um if you're passionate and you want to do something, uh, now there are many more tools and organizations and support groups, particularly for women. And I do mentor a couple of female talent in the market. 
they are very, very excited of what payment services and payments come technology together, combined technology together is going to create even more bigger opportunities. So a whole lot more to see. Thank you so much, Nish. That concludes our interview questions. It's so great to have you with us today. Thank you, Ruby, and thank you um, for having me. I really enjoyed this conversation. Great. Thanks, Nish. Now back to you, Joe. Thanks, Ruby and Rupesh. And thank you, Nish, for those insights. And thanks for watching the Vision by Protivity interview. For Nish, Ruby, and Rupesh, I'm Joe Kornick. We'll see you next time.